Is Viserion now a White Walker dragon or a White Dragon? Did the Night King know that Danny would arrive with her dragons? What is the significance of the mountain shaped like an arrowhead? And what did Beric mean when he told Jon that neither of them would experience much joy in this life? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. Please do consider subscribing if you enjoy the video. This is my Q&A video for episode 6 of season 7. I'll be answering the most popular questions put to me by my patrons and in the comments section to my videos. Let's start with a question from Mr. KG Dickey. Is Viserion now a White Walker dragon or a White Dragon? This is actually not a simple question to answer because we do not know all the mechanics of how people or dragons are turned by the Night King. But from what we have seen with humans, White Walkers are created by being converted while they are alive, for example with Craster's sons. The Whites, on the other hand, are dead bodies that have been reanimated. For example, when the Night King reanimated all those who had been killed in the battle at Hardhome. So if Viserion were a human, then the answer would probably be that she is now a White. But Viserion isn't a human. She is a massive, magical creature once thought extinct. And there are some hints that the Night King didn't use the same process he uses for reanimating dead humans. The Night King touched Viserion's body in the same way that he touched Craster's baby to turn it into a White Walker. And Viserion's eyes now seem a deeper, brighter blue than the White's eyes are. So maybe this is different. The truth is, the show doesn't make it clear, and the director of the episode even admitted that he didn't know himself. Personally, I don't think it would be right to label Viserion as either of these two options. The show probably won't go into details anyway, which is probably fair and actually adds to the mystery. The White Walkers themselves were a lot scarier when we had literally no idea of what they were capable of. I think we should instead just create a completely new category of Ice Dragon, because it is completely unlike anything we have seen before. We literally have no idea yet of what an Ice Dragon like this can do, what powers it has, what it retains from its previous existence as a normal dragon, and so on. Dragons are different to everything else in Westeros, so Ice Dragons should be too. For once, I'm enjoying not knowing exactly what is going on here, and I'm looking forward to finding out more. Oz Johnny and Jar Indeed and lots of other people ask if the Night King was actually laying a trap for the dragons. This is a very popular theory and one I have a lot of sympathy for. It is clear that the Night King was waiting for something. He was sat on his horse doing nothing for a long time during that standoff. The straightforward answer is, of course, that he just thought time was on his side. Like an army besieging a castle, he just needed to wait and the victory would be his. Eventually the ice would freeze over or the humans would freeze to death. But this ignores quite how powerful an individual the Night King is. And although his face is not the most expressive in Westeros, you might expect at least a double take when three fire-breathing dragons arrive to burn his army. But instead he just takes one of the spears that he brought with him and takes aim, as if none of this was a surprise, and this is actually the reason why he brought those spears in the first place. But how could he have known? Danny only just decided to fly up there. Well, I think this takes us into the realms of visions and magic. We don't know the full extent of the Night King's powers, but we do know that he can see when other people have visions of him, as he did with Bran last season, and take full advantage of it. And we also know that someone did have a vision of this very battle, Sandor, back in Episode 1. So it is entirely within the powers we know the Night King has, and is typical of the kind of tactics he uses, for him to use Sandor's visions and adapt his plans accordingly bringing a load of spears with him to kill the dragons he saw, with a view to turning them afterwards. 
Who knows, maybe he even saw Viserion plunge through the ice and decided to bring some massive chains with him as well, just to help him haul him back up. It's a bit wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey, seeing yourself doing something in the future and manipulating events in the present to make it happen, or change the details of what happened, but it's not dissimilar to the kind of time loop we've already seen with Hodor's storyline. So it's certainly not beyond the story writers. So yes, on balance I think the Night King probably was waiting for the dragons to arrive. In my Explained video for episode 6, I pointed out that the mountain we see in the background of this episode, that the Hound saw in his vision, was also in the background of Bran's flashback to the creation of the first White Walker. Some eagle-eyed viewers like Kelly Zahara have pointed out that it is also in the background when the Night King brands him. So what does this mean? Well, I think there are a few things here. First, we should be clear on geography. The battle that we saw in episode 6 appears to have taken place on the south side of this mountain. At least, that's the direction John and Co are coming at it from. And the flashback to the Children of the Forest appears to be from the north of the mountain. So we came within a mile or two of the main characters setting foot on this sacred place where the White Walkers were first created. And the White Walkers are presumably now in possession of it. Second, it means that either the Three-Eyed Raven's Cave is in a different place in the show to where it is in the books, in the books it appears to be here, not too far from the Fist of the First Men, or the Night King can fast travel to Bran's location with his army, or perhaps the Night King was already at the Three-Eyed Raven's Cave and Bran's vision was from the future or the past or some other timey-wimey thing. Whatever the case here, we should probably look at the Night King's attack on the Three-Eyed Raven's Cave in a completely new light, or at least look at the Night King's powers in a whole new light. Third, the climate appears to have changed a lot since the White Walkers were created. This used to be green, verdant grasslands, now, everywhere north of the wall seems to be sub-zero, even during the height of summer. Perhaps the White Walkers really do bring winter. Finally, we shouldn't overlook the thematic link here. We already know that the White Walkers are obsessed with their creation, hence the repeated recreations of the pattern of standing stones. And here again, they are returning to that scene, or right next to it. This has to be central to what they want. Finally, R.N. Smith, 2003, and Lady B asked what Beric meant when he said that he and John wouldn't find much joy in this life. This is a really interesting one, because in the books, Beric is very much a precursor or foreshadower of John. He is brought back from death as a fire white, which surely means that John will come back in the books much as he did in the show and he will experience the same kind of half-life that Beric does. And judging from these comments from George R. R. Martin, that won't be a very pleasant experience. Beric also prefigures John in as much as he is one of the first to take a step above the Game of Thrones, and try to bring people together to protect those who can't protect themselves. The Brotherhood Without Banners, despite all its flaws, was formed as a reaction against the fighting between the ruling classes of Westeros. They fought for no lord, hence being without banners. And as is very evident in the show, Jon is dedicated to this very thing, bringing people together to tackle the greater threat to humanity, not the endless squabbling over the Iron Throne. This is a thankless task. It is one that requires complete focus and dedication and little time to relax and enjoy the finer things in life. And John's character is also not much given to stopping and enjoying the moment. He accepts the burdens of responsibility with a heavy heart and a grim determination. In all this context, Beric's comments make total sense. He sees them both as kindred spirits. Soldiers who are following the orders of the Red God, even if they don't know or understand them. It's not a prophecy. In fact, it's a statement of the obvious. There are dark, cold days coming. There won't be much joy for anyone, let alone those who will be forever on the front line. 
Beric almost certainly sees his ultimate fate as giving his life in the service of the Red God, even more so now that Thoros has gone, and the show is unlikely to have a fairy tale ending of Jon enjoying a happy retirement with the love of his life and a perfect little family. So I have to agree with Beric here. Both of them won't experience much joy from now on in. What do you think about these issues? Let me know in the comments below. If you'd like to support me in making these videos, the best way to do it is through Patreon, and I've got a great community starting to grow over there. And of course, if you want to know when my next video comes out, then please click on the subscribe button and make sure your notifications are enabled. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.